um, we are going to first of all have a little discussion about one more concept. Um, it's a concept I want to introduce because it does have um, a big impact. Obviously, we won't we won't get a chance to like you know have any hands-on experience with it, but I think it's good to be exposed and be familiar with it, and talk a little bit about how it's done. Um, <coughs> and uh, then we have the course evaluation, and then the rest of the time will be work time. So we probably won't have a full-length lecture today. Uh, between the evaluation and giving you extra time to, to work on that. On Wednesday of this week, two days from now, we'll have a review session for the final exam. I would expect I'll have the review guide for the final to be posted. I don't think it's already posted. I, I had thought about posting it, but I don't think I actually did. But I will have it posted by Wednesday so that we can go over it. And then the final will be um, a week from today, regular regular time, 8 o'clock, but up in lab. All right, let's, let's think of a, 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 of a couple of different situations. All right, um, actually we, we had our mobile presentation last week and one of the things that they, they talked about was having services. All right, let's consider uh, a few situations. Let's say I am a company that sells merchandise, and I use Federal Express to ship the merchandise, you know, from, the, from wherever it is to the, to the customer. Now, it would be nice if I could put on my website information from Federal Express about, like, where the shipment was, when it's expected to arrive, has it shipped yet, and so on and so forth. All right. I guess you could do something like linking to Federal Express's page, but it'd be nice if right on my page, right when you viewed the order, there'd be some shipping information that would give you up to the minute uh, information about your, your goods and how they were shipped. So incorporated right in your web page, it would be nice if you could have information from Federal Express. That's one scenario. Second scenario um, would be, let's say I run a golf course, and if I run a golf course, um, people visiting my page might want to know my hours, but they might also want to know what the weather is going to be today. All right, um, and you know, like they should say, the hour by hour forecast, the 24 hour forecast. You know, at at 10 o'clock it's going to rain, at at 11 o'clock it's going to be cloudy, then noon it's supposed to be sunny. So you could, it'd be nice if a golf course could present that um, to their people, to you know, to their potential customers, so that they could take a look and, and, and plan their day and figure out how to do it, or Cedar Point, or any any kind of place like that. The example that our our speaker in the mobile uh, information ses session talked about was this place. Uh, uh, I forget, I forget the name of the company. Truck Stops of America, yeah, runs truck stops, and one of the things that they do is they can do things like, you know, a, a truck driver can schedule showers, uh, they can get a report on how full the parking lot is, can they park there overnight, is there space for them, all sorts of information that, that as a truck driver you might want to know. Well, guess what? This information, they would like to be available on the website, I would imagine, uh, on an Android application, and in an iPod or iPad uh, application, iPad or iPhone application. So you want the same data be shown uh, in a lot of different places. All of these examples of where you want data from one place to show up somewhere else. And the first example is data from Federal Express that would show up on my company's web page to show you the product that I'm shipping where it's going to be. In the other case, it was the golf course or Cedar Point wanting to show a weather forecast to help help their customers plan their day. And in the other case, it was all within one company, but it was one company wanting to show certain pieces of data in a variety of different ways in a variety of different contexts. Now, again, there's a lot of ways this can be done, but one way this can be done is through what are called services. And sort of the general term for this is RMI, or remote method invocation. That's a good buzzword. This might actually be a little bit of an older one. The other thing that you hear is SOA, which stands for, I believe, Service Oriented Architecture.
let's look at these. Uh, let's look at these two two buzzwords and break them down and and try to analyze what they mean. RMI, remote method invocation. Well, we know what those words mean. You know, let's put them together and see if we can make sense of of the whole phrase. First of all, method method is a function, right? So we're talking about making function calls. Invoke or an invocation or invoke is another way of saying calling. Um, so a method invocation is I want to invoke or call a method. All right, so far so good. Remote, what does that mean in this context? What that means in this context is I'm going to call a method on an object that lives, in the case of Java, that lives in another heap. All right, that lives on another Java virtual machine. All right, it's probably the simplest, most straightforward way to do it. So let's think back of our uh, Federal Express example. Let's look at our Federal Express example. And in that case, we have a customer sitting at home browsing the internet, connected to the internet, hitting my company's web server. And what my company has is it has a database full of orders and stuff like that. But what my company doesn't have is Federal Express doesn't send my company notifications when something is shipped. To be sure, Federal, Federal uh, Express has their own system where they keep track of that things. And in fact, they even let that open to people so that they can see the status of their project. So, you know, they want people to be able to track their stuff via Federal Express. So here we have somewhere else in the world, Federal Express's server. And this might not be necessarily a web server. This might be what's called an application server. All right. And that application server might be hooked up to their database and in turn all of their code, all their classes, and so on. So effectively what we want to be able to do is we want to go and we want to go and kind of cross this line and ask Federal Express's web server, hey, I pulled this shipment up out of my database, what's its current status? And then it can return, to, we can return that information in some format back to my company and then my company's web page, page can display it just like it would display any other data from any other data source. All right. Um, that's an example of remote method invocation because I'm asking Federal Express what's the status of Package number one two nine five six seven, all right, or something along those lines, and it's returning it to me. Well, obviously, there's there's some unique uh, architectural issues with this, all right. This isn't straightforward, you know, to be able to call a, a a method on an object that lives on another machine. And there's a few things that kind of simplify that. First of all, there's different protocols that are used uh, to, to make those remote methods, uh, remote method calls. Oftentimes, in situations like this, it involves the use of what are called enterprise Java beans or EJBs. All right. For example, in the case of EJB, what would happen is my company's machine would actually create a little proxy object, which kind of look like kind of looks like the real object but doesn't do any of the real work it just passes the work over to the uh, to the actual bean that lives over here and then it does the work thing about a bean is and again un unfortunately we don't have time to cover them in great detail but it's sort of a standard way of representing either entities or session information there are entity beans which are persistent that means that they, they stay around. They're mapped to databases, typically. And, and the, the Bean architecture allows for some very standard low-level code, you know, mapping to a database, getting and setting 
attributes and all that to be done. And it's a very standard way of doing it and it makes for things like this. The other thing that is, is often used as far as standards go is oftentimes the data comes back from the remote call as XML, all right, as a piece of XML data, all right. Or it could be something that's serialized, you know, and it could go back and forth that way. So there's a lot of ways that the specifics of this can go, but in principle the idea is, is we want to open up and be able to access um, machines and access objects on those machines and make method calls from, from that. So this could be done a lot of different ways, but this is one way through RMI and, and all that. SOA for service oriented architecture involves viewing your, your uh, business, um, you know, your business rules and your business classes as performing services. You create services that can be asked from many places for their information. What they were talking about, uh, what the truck stop to uh, folks were talking about is they have, again, an application server. He didn't really go into the details, but I would assume it would be an application server. And then their iPhone app and their Android app. So this isn't a web application. This is a, uh, this is a native Android or, or uh, iOS app connects to the internet and asks these services for certain information. You know, here is my here are my GPS coordinates. You know, I'm I'm going down I-90 in Elyria, Ohio. Where is the nearest truck stop? Does it have showers available? What kind of eating options are there? And so on and so forth. Now the nice thing is, again, remember that anytime we talk about a client and a server, we talk about a client making the request and the server satisfying it. It would be at least theoretically possible to do something where these applications would sort of directly go to a database server and get this information or do something like that. But again, uh, the iPhone and Android application would have to be written such that, um, you know, it has to be written custom for those platforms. Because again, you can't run an iPhone application on an Android machine and vice versa. All right. So it's much better to have a server that provides a certain service. And that service is you send it a question, what are the restaurants close to Elyria, Ohio, and it returns you an answer in some format. Very likely XML. And then the client can take that and format it and do whatever it needs to. All right. Now again, I, I want to go back a little bit. I'm not even sure if it would really be feasible even to have these to connect directly to their database and do that. But even if you could, you wouldn't want to. All right. You'd want the mechanism and you want to control this. Then you don't have two sets of code looking at things. You have one set of code that returns the results and these two things format it however it needs to be formatted specific for an iPhone or specifically for an Android device. And then tacking stuff onto this becomes easy, right? Because one of the clients to this application server can itself be a web server and someone browsing the internet can ask the web server for some information the web server makes a remote method call to the application server and gets the results. I, I worked on one project that had this architecture. It was back, uh, and again, this is back over 10 years ago. All right, so I'm sure they've, they, they've changed it, but I do know and, and, and the funny thing is, is I, I've, I've actually played around with the functionality and, and a, lot of, a lot of the basic functionality is the same. But it was Kay Jeweler's website and Kay uses WebSphere which is sort of a, uh, an, a combination application server and, and framework for developing these sorts of applications. And um, again, we use this architecture. Believe me, the hardest thing in coding in this environment, at least for us, 
wasn't the actual coding of the classes themselves. That's a piece of cake. It's getting everything configured to talk to each other, right? Because, you know, where's the problem? You know, in our situation, we had something like this. We had our, you know, we had our clients that were going in and accessing via the internet their web server. And the web server had some um, servlets, had some JSP pages that it would access. The web server would talk to the application server, which in turn talked to a database server. Well, something doesn't work, where's the problem? Who knows? <laughs> All right, who knows? And usually the problem was more like just they weren't configured to talk to each other, right? It wasn't that necessarily the code was horrible or anything like that. It was like, okay, well, this giant XML file that we use to configure these things, we put in a semicolon instead of a comma, something stupid like that. All right. Back at the time we did it, too, the tools were not very good for like maintaining these con configuration files. Actually, you just use a plain old text editor uh, editing up XML stuff. Which, which, was, which got pretty, pretty gory. But the code itself was, was dare I say, trivial. You know? uh, working on these things, piece of cake. Even working on, on this level stuff wasn't bad, really. The places where these things intersected, where they talked to each other, is where the problem comes in. Now, why do you go through all this pain, all right, if it's difficult? You go through all of it largely for like scalability. Um, theoretically, one machine could serve all these roles, but again, then that machine would be really working over time, you know, and uh, you know, be very difficult uh, to do that. Uh, by, by spreading it out like this, you you uh, you give the you give the capability and you give the potential to get a lot of efficiencies and and be able to scale for large numbers of visitors as opposed to, you know, just, you know, dozens of visitors, but a lot of concurrent visitors doing things and all that. So, again, that's why you go through all this. It is interesting. It is, um, there are a lot of parallels between this and a lot of other things that we can do, we do in computer science, but again, what this keeps coming back to are some of the very most basic concepts. You know, separating your user interface from your business logic, all right? You can't do this kind of thing if you don't do that, right? Um, encapsulation, having everything about a particular entity living in one class, you know? In other words, make a component so it can be plugged into a lot of different places, all right? Not exposing your... Uh, uh, attributes to the outside world using private attributes and public methods. Well, again, what does that do for you? Well, in this kind of environment when stuff's flying around all over the place, you don't want the ability for something to be corrupt by being set the wrong way or, or whatever. You want a very controlled environment and, and you want to very limit the, the way that, you, limit what and how you're exposing the different attributes to, to outside folks. Wish we had a lot more time to talk about this. I did just want to cover it on a conceptual level. Um, I guess that's all I had. Do you have any questions? All right. Let me go tell them to shut this off and then we can.